إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون O Muslims, if you look at our Islamic history with a bird's eye view the last 14 and a half centuries you find that subhanallah our entire civilization it has so many highs but it also has so many low points as well you find a constant battle between political ascendancy versus defeat constant ups followed by downs followed by ups followed by downs and this reality it begins in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Look at the Battle of Badr and the great victory. And look at the Battle of Uhud. Look at the Battle of Khandaq, one hair's width away from complete disaster. And a year and a half later, look at the conquest of Mecca, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enters and conquers the very city that expelled him. When our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away after 23 years of preaching, Quite literally, he changed the course of human history. Never before had millions of people known as the Arabs united under any common cause, under any common civilization. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam managed to do with the help of Allah what no human being had ever been done. An entire race, an entire civilization, a new religion with a common goal, with a common purpose. And subhanAllah, the magnificent achievements were just about to begin. Just when we thought Islam is going to spread like a magnificent flower, subhanAllah, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was the catalyst for the, initial for the initial fracturing of the ummah. It was very close to complete demolishment. Tens of thousands of people left the faith because Iman wasn't strong in their hearts. And Allah blessed a leader, the likes of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. Allah blessed Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to come and for two years he waged wars and campaigns and treaties to reunite the ummah and to save what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had begun and then the era of conquest began the likes of which the monumentous changes to human histories the likes of which history books still talk about a hitherto unknown civilization the Arabs a hitherto unheard of religion the Muslims they come literally out of nowhere they come out of the deserts of Arabia and they rise up to change challenge not one but both of the superpowers that had been battling between themselves for a thousand years this unknown civilization takes on two superpowers simultaneously on the one hand they are fighting the Sassanid Persians and the same year they are fighting the Byzantine Romans and Allah blesses victory after victory and subhanallah like wildfire our religion the ummah it spreads it eliminates the Sassanid Empire in totality an empire that had stood the course of history for over a thousand years and it carves out the Byzantine Roman Empire in half and half of what used to be the Roman Empire was absorbed proudly into the Ummah historic cities for the Romans where is Carthage where is Syria where is Alexandria that used to be bastions of the Roman Empire they are now dead center in the Middle East and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed our Ummah to overtake and to absorb these massive civilizations and they are now a proud part of our own heritage but as swiftly as this stunning and magnificent victory comes up subhanallah it is soon followed by yet another disaster and that is from within our own ranks an internal civil war between respected and senior companions more people and more people's lives are lost in this internal war the battle of Jamal the battle of Safin more people's lives are lost in this internal war than the combined loss of all of the victories against others and subhanallah 
subhanallah, it is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal. This civil war eventually results in the end of the first era, the era of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. But from the ashes of the Khulafa, another dynasty comes up, and that is the Umayyads. And they establish the beginnings of a new type of civilization, the first truly global Muslim civilization. They create a new currency. They create a new GDP. They create a new infrastructure. And in the span of a few years, in the early 700s of the CE, the Muslims once again are now conquering unknown portions of the world. One army in Sindh, another in Spain. Even Charlemagne, the emperor of the, of the Roman Empire, has to engage with this new dynasty barely a hundred years after its prophet preached in Arabia. At the same time that Muslims are carving out Hindustan and Sindh, they're also carving out places of Europe in what is now Andalusia and Spain. And once again, it looked like nothing would stop the expanse of the Muslim world. But this is the sunnah of Allah in his creation. This too fizzled out and internal policies became more critical. And yet another civil war erupted within the ranks of the Ummah. Damascus was besieged, partially destroyed, and the Umayyad dynasty almost wiped out. And from their ashes, another comes up. And this is the Abbasids. And the Abbasids moved their capital to Iraq. And within a few decades, from the perspective of modern historians, they say this is the golden age of the Ummah. And there is an element of truth for us. The actual golden age is the Seerah and the Khulafa al-Rashidun. But no doubt, from the perspective of technology, from the perspective of science, from the perspective of intellectual growth, from the secular sciences, no doubt the early Abbasid era really does represent one of, if not the biggest pinnacle of Islamic civilization. Harun al-Rashid, he establishes Baghdad, the city of the thousand and one nights, and the Darul Hikmah and the largest libraries and the grandiose mosques. And this is indeed the era of Islamic achievements and also the golden age of scholarship. But again, by now you know the story up and down, up and down. And so within a few decades, quite literally at the death of Harun al Rashid, his own two sons, his biological sons, wage war between themselves. And once again, another civil war overtakes the Ummah. And from that battle, the Ummah never fully recovers the grandiose era of the Abbasids and within a few decades within a few decades the Abbasid dynasty remains a shell and who takes over a non-Sunni dynasty comes in a Vazirid comes in the Abbasids are still token figures like the Queen of England they're just token figures and the real power is in the hand of a non-Sunni group and they are a bunch of Viziers that come in they change the entire discourse and landscape and the Abbasid dynasty dynasty crumbles and multiple dynasties come from within it. The Tulunids, the Idrisids, the Aghlabids, another di dynasty, the Fatimids come in Egypt. The Umayyads are now coming back to power in Andalusia and from a land that is now known as Bahrain, a radical empire emerges known as the Qaramita or the Karamatians. And once again, civil war undertakes the Ummah and the Qaramita attack not the Abbasid Caliphate. They attack the Muslim, the Muslim capital of religion and that is Mecca. The Qaramita who claim to be Muslims, they attack Mecca during the Hajj season to make a political point that we should be in charge and not the pseudo Abbasids that are in charge. And they massacre Hujjaj in the Baytullah al-Haram and they block up the well of Zamzam with dead bodies and astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, they even crumble the Kaaba and steal Hajr al-Aswad. For more than 20 years there was no Hajr al-Aswad. There was was no black stone. People will do tawaf and the Kaaba has not been reconstructed and the Hajar Aswad has an empty spot there. Two, two decades of pilgrims did not get to see Hajar Aswad. This was a shock the likes of which the Ummah had never seen. This was a shock that struck the Ummah to its core. How can we not have the Kaaba? How can we not have the Hajar Aswad? And it was only returned 20 plus years later. A very bleak time for the Ummah. But again, you know the story from those ashes now rises superpowers as well multiple dynasties still the Abbasids are nominally in charge but in reality they are long gone in terms of actual power other dynasties come and these are powerful dynasties these are dynasties that contribute to the Ummah the Ghaznavids come up in what is now Afghanistan and Iran and areas of Pakistan they create an empire the likes of which we marvel at to this day 
cities like Tehran, like Samarkand, like Lahore, they're under the Ghaznavids and they demonstrate the power of Islam. They also have their own GDP, their own currency. They also create an entire empire and also simultaneously a new race has embraced Islam by the 10th century. An unheard of race, a, a warrior race, they are called the Turks. Before this time the Turks were not Muslims. In the 10th century they convert and the first of many Turkish dynasties began to rise and these are the Seljuks and the Seljuks come out of nowhere and they save the Abbasid Caliphate from the hands of the heretical viziers that were there. The Seljuks march into Baghdad and they return the Abbasids into power and they cleanse the heresies that were there and they install mainstream orthodoxy back and their main minister that is Nizam al, Nizam al Mulk he comes to power and Nizam al Mulk is a political scientist. He writes books about the first book ever written about political science. It is Nizam al Mulk and he was a politician and he was a vizier. We still read his book to this day. It's called Siyasat Nama in Persian. You can read it to this day. So he comes to power and subhanallah once again establishes entire universities, infrastructures, masajid and once again we think Islam is on the rise. But you know the story up and down up and down and so what happens yet another cycle comes as if out of nowhere another dynasty sorry another civilization an unheard of civilization until this point in time muslims had never heard of these people because they were nobodies till the 11th century we now know them as europeans but back then they were complete majhul al ayn al nakira they were completely unknown in the books of history they come out of nowhere these lands muslims have never heard of france and England these are non-existent in the mind and the vocabulary of Muslims they hadn't established any type of empire this is the ascent of Europe now and they decide for reasons historians are still wondering at they decide they're gonna invade the Muslim lands and they gather together peasants they gather together farmers and they carry the cross and that in French is called the Crusaders the carrying of the cross they carry the cross and they have this perverted ideology they have to free the holy lands and so tens of thousands of peasants and farmers along with some warriors obviously they began marching from across Germany across France across England across Italy and they start making their way raping pillaging rampaging through all the lands they go to and they make their way to Jerusalem and of course you know the story brothers and sisters subhanallah as usual while they're making their way straight to Jerusalem we are busy fighting ourselves and quite literally two blood brothers the same father and mother two full blood brothers they are battling over who will be the next Sultan the next Vizier the next Prime Minister they are literally going to war and no exaggeration a few hundred miles underneath them the crusaders are slowly marching on and they couldn't care less because they want the kursi so they're fighting each other and the crusaders come along slowly but surely and subhanallah the rest as you know is history in the beginning of the 11th century end of the 10th century beginning of the 11th century they enter Jerusalem and one of the worst massacres that hitherto the world has hardly seen one of the most brutal massacres takes place where every single man woman and child living in that city of Jerusalem was killed with the sword it took 30 days to kill people they lined them up in Masjid al-Aqsa and they killed them one after the other and not just the Muslims the Christians that didn't belong to their sect and the Jewish people all of them were killed the entire city was devastated and this too sent a shockwave almost a heart attack to the Ummah how can Al-Aqsa be taken how can this band of nobodies a bunch of peasants come out of nowhere and they take over Jerusalem but you know the story as well and you already understand where this khutbah is going rise and fall rise and fall and so from the ashes of Jerusalem rose up a new race a new group of people who were hitherto almost unknown the Kurdish people the Kurdish people had within themselves some dynasties and they began to rise up until finally Allah blesses the Zengids and then Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi to come forth and after almost a hundred years of Jerusalem being away from the Muslim lands he comes in and he marches in and Allah blesses through the 
Battle of Hittin, the reconquering of Jerusalem. And now multiple dynasties once again are established. Once again, there is wind in our sails. Once again, the Ummah's on the ascent here. You have the Seljuqs, you have the Mamluks, you had other people rising up. And Alhamdulillah, things seemed very good. But as you know, this is the Sunnah of Allah fi khalqihi. And so it is as if barely have we recovered from the loss of Jerusalem. It is as if barely we're getting our bearings together again. And lo and behold, on the horizon, there is yet a new dynasty. There is a new race of people, a new civilization, hitherto unheard of once again in human history. And these are the Mongols and the followers of Chengiz Khan, Genghis Khan. And they come from a direction the Muslims were never expecting, and that is the Far East. And Genghis Khan comes with his followers and one of the most brutal epochs and eras in all of human history begins not just us Europeans were also slaughtered and Genghis Khan and the invasion of the Mongols changes world history and they keep on marching and marching until finally Genghis Khan's grandson reaches the very gates of Baghdad and the unthinkable happens. The city of Harun al-Rashid, the city of a thousand and one nights, the city that people thought was completely impregnable. It is a fortress. Nobody can possibly. Baghdad was the largest city in the world at the time and the most protected city and the most advanced city. Nobody could have ever imagined that Baghdad could ever be attacked by a bunch of outsiders. But indeed, it is a Allah's Sunnah. And so in 1248, Hulaku Khan surrounds Baghdad and after the siege and whatnot, once again, one of the largest massacres. This massacre was much larger than Jerusalem. It is said up to a million people maybe because Baghdad was completely ravaged. And not just the people, not just these million souls, the largest libraries in the world, the most technologically advanced books in physics and astronomy and biology all missing and gone because the Mongols couldn't read and write and they thought books were black magic. So they destroyed books after books and they killed everybody until finally the final Khalifa of the Abbasids. They took him, they made sure he watched the whole spectacle and they wrapped him in a rug and they ran their horses over him. Thus came to the end one of the magnificent dynasties and that is the Abbasids. To say this was a shock is an understatement. It was almost a heart attack, or maybe it was a heart attack. If you look at the people writing at this time, it is as if they thought Qiyamah has come. They thought that's it, there is no recovery. How can you recover after Baghdad? How can you recover when the Abbasid Caliphate has gone? How can there be progress when there is no major city left? All of the major cities that used to be bastions of civilization were completely destroyed by the invasion of Hulaku Khan. Nothing was left and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sunnah we know it once again from the ashes of the destruction of the Mongols rose yet a new dynasty yet a new race yet a new group of people from a land that hitherto had not had any major civilization and of course this was about to change after this and this was the Mamluks in Egypt the Mamluks rose and they were a very small dynasty a fringe dynasty nobody had ever heard of them had it not been for this incident there would have been a fit, footnote in history but Allah used them to change the course of history and the first defeat against the Mongols was given in the battle of Ain Jalut when, when, uh, when uh, the, the Mamluks took on uh, the forces of Hulaku and destroyed them for the very first time and once again the ascendancy begins and subhanallah out of the east another civilization comes a, a cousin of the Seljuqs, not exactly the same biological uh, uh, tribe, but a cousin of the Seljuqs. And another Turkish warrior comes along and his name is Uthman. And from his descendants, a dynasty will come. The Ottoman dynasty, the Usmanlis, the Ottoman dynasty will come. And they will come once again out of nowhere and begin capturing and begin consolidating and begin regrouping and giving some izzah to the Ummah. And lo and behold, in the middle of the 15th century, barely 500 years ago in the middle of the 15th century they laid siege to the capital of the Roman Empire a capital that had withstood numerous sieges and numerous attacks for over 1200 years and this is of course Constantinople and they conquered Constantinople and they renamed it Istanbul and the rest as they say is history and we can go on and on time has to cause us to stop going here but again of recent we know one of the biggest negatives that happened is 
the era of colonization, the era of European superpowers and their children and descendants, the era of Western superpowers rising up and invading Muslim lands, dividing up the Ummah, abolishing the Caliphate, dividing the Ummah into 50 plus nation states, scattering millions of Muslims away from the lands that used to be theirs. We are but a product of that diaspora. Why are there millions of Muslims all around the world right now? And scattering all of us to these lands and we are seeing what is happening in Gaza and Palestine and subhanallah brothers and sisters indeed the heart is saddened and during these last months I have been speaking to so many of our youth and one sentiment that I find and this is why I'm giving this khutbah one sentiment that I find our youth especially are wondering how is this happening and in fact some amongst them not a lot some amongst them are even questioning their faith these political defeats are actually bringing out doubts into them like how can this be how can there be so much genocide and massacre and bloodshed and what will happen to the ummah and so brothers and sisters today's khutbah is a brief foray it is a bird's eye view of islamic history to remind ourselves of the lessons of history and to derive many lessons but because of time i'll restrict myself to three because of time i will mention three lessons number one in this brief 20 minute overview of the entire history of the last 14 and a half centuries you already saw the sunnah of allah that nations and dynasties rise and fall and this is the reality of all nations how long do nations last how long do countries last how long do do the dynasties last no dynasty lasts for more than a few centuries this is the reality open your eyes and our history is no different our history is no different whether it was the abbasids or the umayyads or the tughlubids or the ilkhanids or the the Shawarism, or the Khawarism Shahs or anybody, it doesn't matter. It comes, it rises, and it goes. No dynasty lasts forever. Only Allah is Al Baqi, and dynasties come and go. And this is the reality of all dynasties. So don't lose hope just because one era or one epoch or one dynasty or one nation is on the is on the low side. Don't worry about it. Allah says in the Quran, when I say don't worry, I mean obviously worry, but don't make it a cause of concern of your iman. Allah says in the Quran, what these are the days of the of the eras we distribute it amongst people some you have good days others you have bad days some you have good centuries others you have bad centuries and we see this in our own history the second point i want to derive is that oh muslims in all of this i only mention the political history on the side the same time frame, there is another history going on, and that is the history of intellectual ideas, Islamic scholarship. In every era, in every time frame, in every land, whether there is up and down, ulama are thriving. Books are being written. Islamic scholarship is always at the forefront and people's imans are strong. So don't just look at politics. Don't just look at dynasties. Don't just look at invasions and defeats and massacres. Also look on the other side, what is happening. And I say now, indeed our hearts are very sad at what is happening in Gaza. Our hearts are so sad at the reality of the situation of our Uyghur brothers and sisters. What is happening in Sudan? What is happening across the world? Our hearts are so sad. At the same time, not a justification, but at the same time, look at the global revival taking place. Look at the concerted spirit, the connection the Ummah feels with itself. This is unprecedented in our lifetimes we have not seen this level of resurgence so out of evil comes good and we see this from our history and the last and final point for our khutbah again much more to derive but obviously time is always against us the last and final point O muslim realize our lord has promised to protect this ummah until the day of judgment and our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a dua to allah that oh allah protect his ummah and he told us allah has answered my dua and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this ummah the best of all ummas and our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this ummah will be zahidin ala al haq the truth will always be manifest until the trumpet is blown and indeed the promise of allah is true and dear muslim the main point I want to derive from all of this despite all of the political ups and especially downs despite all of the negatives that have occurred in terms of defeats of a military nature defeats of a political nature look around you how is the ummah 
Where is the Ummah? It is alive and strong. The Ummah is now the largest Ummah on the planet. And I mean what I say because we are the only Ummah that actually believes in what we stand for. True, if you ask people on the street what they believe, one religion and that is Christianity is more than us. But you and I both know, you and I both know the bulk of Christians do not have an iota of actual faith with regards to their theology. They are culturally Christian and that is genuinely sad we'd much rather they be believing Christians than atheists and agnostics but it is what it is we are the only ummah and the largest ummah and the most powerful ummah in terms of what not in terms of GDP not in terms of military might not in terms of powers and dynasties but in terms of raw faith in terms of Iman, in terms of spirituality, we are second to none. And that has been the case constantly from the beginning of time, from the revelation of Iqra all the way up until our times. This Ummah has never been vanquished in its spirit, in its soul, in its Iman, in its Taqwa. And that is the ultimate victory. O oh Muslims, O oh youth, do not lose hope in Allah's promise. Allah's promise is true and Allah's promise is being manifest as we speak don't look at victory in terms of numbers in terms of body counts in terms of dynasties in terms of politics look at victory in terms of the spirit in terms of the soul in terms of the iman in terms of trust in Allah and belief in Allah and if you understand victory to be like this then wallahi thumma wallahi thumma wallahi we have been and we are and we shall continue to be victors until the day of judgment do not give up do not lose your hope and you will be victorious you are victorious victory is not in body counts victory is not in the amount of bombs they throw on us victory is in our spirits and our souls and they cannot and they shall not and they will not conquer our victory our souls and our iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the promise of Allah throughout all of these ups and downs the ummah has not just remained it has thrived it has flourished despite all the genocides despite all the attacks we have grown not just in quantity but in quality that is real victory where are the Romans long gone where are the followers of Chinggis Khan long gone where are the Sassanids long gone where is the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the question is, where is there not the Ummah? Every city, every village, every land, Alhamdulillah, we pack the Masajid to the max in this month of Ramadan. Every masjid in the world was packed beyond capacity. That is the victory and no one can compete with us when it comes to this. And Allah has promised this in the Quran. This is the promise of Allah and the promise of Allah is true so do not lose hope put your trust in Allah and the tide of history and the politics of history and the history of politics it goes up and down but true victory is the victory of the heart and we shall and we have been and we will continue to be a victorious ummah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran and he make us of those who is verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan I ask Allah's forgiveness, you as well ask him for his the Ghafoor and the Rahman. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, the one and the unique. He it is whom we worship and it is his aid that we seek. He is the Lord of the oppressed and he hears the prayer of the weak. As to what follows, O Muslims, as we said, the real victory is the victory of the heart. The real victory is the victory of Iman that shall remain strong. And now that Ramadan is over, and now that we have all tasted the fruits of Iman, now that we have all realized the beauty of what it means to worship Allah, O Muslim, on this first Friday after Ramadan, you have been victorious and I have been victorious in that Allah allowed us to witness this month, fast this month, pray this month, do extra deeds in this month. O Muslim, 
Do not destroy that victory in your own life. Do not be the cause of your own downfall because this is the ultimate downfall. This is the ultimate defeat, not the defeat of politics, as I said. And by the way, yes, we want to win politically as well. But if we don't, we will always win from the heart and mind. That's the point I'm trying to stress here. So from this month of Ramadan, O Muslim, now that you have gained the spiritual victory in your own personal life, then continue to be victorious in the months of Shawwal and after Ramadan. On. Continue to raise the bar of your relationship with Allah. Continue to be observant of salah. Continue to frequent the masajid. Continue to have a relationship with the Quran. O oh Muslim, this is the ultimate victory. Whoever is saved from Jahannam and enters Jannah, that is the person that has been victorious. And that victory is not in the hands of the apartheid regime. It's not in in the hands of a superpower it's not in the hands of a political entity that victory it is in your hands and no one can take it away from you other than yourself and if you listen to shaitan make sure oh muslim you are victorious in your personal life make sure you're victorious with your family make sure you're victorious amongst your friends and if we all continue to do so then maybe in our lifetimes we will see the political and historic victory as well because i just explained to you this political loss is only temporary it's just what ayam up and down and perhaps we're seeing a down in one part of the world but it's only a matter of time before the up will come again it's only a matter of time look at history and we want to be alive and see it well then try our best to push that try our best to do that and how are we going to do that by being victorious in our personal lives by making sure we are the best in our personal ethics our personal spirituality our personal morality and if we do so collectively then inshallah ta'ala we too will see that up that will inevitably come we have yaqeen just just like the sun will rise tomorrow, that the ummah will also rise politically and economically. But whether we're alive or not, we must be victorious spiritually. And Allah is the one whom we turn to and trust in. Allahumma inni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la ta'dara fin yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la daynan illa qadayta. Wa la maridan illa shafayta. Wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma fil lana wa li ikhwanina ladhin sabakuna bil imani. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lil ladhin amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. Allah اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بسوء فاشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأبن بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملاكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عزم قائل عليما إن الله ملاك يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وانعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين عباد الله ان الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى اكبر واقم الصلاه فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إليه 